Hi there, what I have sitting next to me here is my latest vintage computer project. It is an IPDS, also known as the Personal Development System. These were made by Intel in back in 1981 through 1983, I think, perhaps. And what it is, is kind of the, for the time, probably the fanciest, most capable industrial style EEPROM programmer that you can buy. It actually has a pod stuck in the side of it over there on that side, uh, which is where the EEPROM chips can go and you can program them, but it's really much, much more than just an EEPROM programmer. While it does do that, um, these pods are removable, and uh, you can get a different pod and stick it in there, like this one here. Um, pull out the EEPROM programmer, plug this one in, and this is, um, this is an 8051 emulation pod. So you would put this in, and this would emulate an 8051 CPU. So this thing was not just a programmer, it was also an emulator. Um, there were emulation pods for the 8085 as well. Uh, so you could emulate an 8085 with this, you could, you could program your EEPROMs of the time, things like the 2732, 2764, 2716 probably. Lots of stuff from the time, I think you could program an 8051 um, and you could do the emulation, but it does even more than that. This, this is really a general purpose computer with two CPUs in it. It's got two 8085 CPUs in it, and you can run those two CPUs concurrently, running different applications in a split screen, uh, kind of two window manner. So you could be using your editor at the same time that you're using your assembler, or you can be uh, programming an EEPROM while you're running your compiler. Now this ran uh, an operating system called ISIS, we're going to try it out, we're going to play with it a bit. And there's also a variant of CPM for it, for those people who like to uh, do CPM. And what's really cool about this particular computer is this was right around the era when bubble memory was popular. And these little bubble memory adapters were being sold. This is a multi-module board. Um, it's got a little piggyback connector on the back. This was designed to plug into a multi-bus computer and it would add bubble memory to your multibus computer. Now this is not a multibus computer, this PDS, but it was designed with an adapter that could go on it that would have the little sockets to mate with these, and you could plug in either four small of these multi-module boards or two big ones. This is actually the big size, it's a double size, um, and you could add uh, multi-module boards to this computer and they designed it to work with the bubble memory. So this, back in 1982, um, is a portable computer with bubble memory built into the firmware. All you have to do is have the right adapter in it and get your SBX251. These things are not super easy to come by, but they can be found on eBay. Uh, plug this in and you can be having solid state storage in your computer. So I'm not gonna talk very much on the bubble memory itself uh, in this video because I've done uh, three or four other videos on bubble memory in various projects. But suffice it to say, the bubble memory was a very cool solid state uh, memory option at the time. It made some inroads into industrial. And if you haven't watched one of the other videos on uh, bubble memory, either my videos or Craig's videos, he's another enthusiast, I encourage you to watch those and learn how bubble memory worked because it was fascinating uh, back in the late 70s, uh, early 80s. Anyway, in this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this computer apart and it didn't come with the multi-module adapter, so I'm going to build one of those and then I'm going to mount my bubble memory to it and then we're going to boot it using the bubble memory. Um, so stay tuned. Let's go ahead and build ourselves a multi-module adapter. So I found on BitSavers a picture of the multi-module adapter, so I know what one looks like, and I know it's not very complicated. It's a bunch of glue logic, a couple of interrupt controllers, and then a bunch of connectors. So I knew if I could find a schematic, I could pretty much build this thing. I did look around at all the usual sources, you know, eBay, various forums. I couldn't find anybody who had one, or if I did find someone who had one, it was their only one, and they didn't want to part with it. But what I did find is over here on Mark Ogden's website, the complete schematic for the board. Everything you need to, to know to build one of these. Uh, original schematic from 1983, showing all the parts, uh, reasonably good, only a few tiny errors that, that are pretty obvious when you see them, but everything you need to know to build this board. Um, and I went ahead and I produced this board myself. 
Now, there was one problem I ran into with the board that I should mention, and that has to do with this section down here, which is the memory wait states. So the, the wait states come off of the individual SBX uh, multi-modules, and they get kind of anded and ORed together, and then they go out to some wait states to the, to the, the A and B CPUs. And I found that this caused the CPU to get stuck in wait. Now, when I built my board, I built it almost exclusively out of HCT logic, including the 74LS00. I used a 74HCT00. And you'll find that, you know, 99 times out of 100, uh, that's going to be just fine. But I think this was that one time when it wasn't just fine. The LS will kind of float up a little bit on its input, uh, whereas an HC HCT does not. And I think what was happening, these things here don't have any active pull-ups, and I think they were triggering a, a memory weight. So I really wish when this board would have been designed, they would have just put pull-ups on these four lines. I think that would be a safer approach. They put pull-ups on some other lines. You can see them right there. They didn't put pull-ups on these. If, if I respin the board, I will probably add pull-ups to those. Uh, but in my case, the the bubble memory modules don't need wait states at all. So I just took this 74LS51 and I pulled it out. Um, I removed it and everything works fine without it. I suspect if I was to replace my HCT00 with an LS00, I would probably be fine as well. Um, or put pull-ups on these lines, probably make it fine. But I want to mention that for anyone who tries to reproduce that. Be a little bit careful in this logic here. Okay, here is my first prototype of the multi-module adapter. You can see I've populated one spot here for uh, one of the SBX boards to plug in. We'll plug in the bubble memory module there. I haven't populated the other four. I've got some headers here where we'll have the cables that hook up to the primary CPU board and the secondary CPU board. Uh, the multi-module board, I've got the standoffs for it. It's going to plug in yeah, right about there. Um, so we'll go ahead and we'll give this a shot. Now the second one would probably run into some trouble if I try to plug it in because these headers here might be too tall uh, with a ribbon cable plugged in. So we might have to change that around to use the second um, two slots over here. But right now I just want to get one slot working first. Now my plan A for dealing with those two slots over there where the header is too tall and, and the multi-module won't fit is to use these parts from TE Connectivity. They're relatively cheap, and what they are, they call them dip plugs, but they're they're the same pitch as a standard header. You know, you can you can kind of see it there from this side and this side. Uh, but they're like the crimp on IDC, but rather than having female sockets, they've got male pins. So I think I can crimp one of these directly onto the ribbon cable. They've got a 34 pin here. They've got a 50 50 pin for the other one. Um, then pull out the header and socket I've got in there, put this in place, and this will be a perfect low-profile solution, and the multi-module will fit right over the top. Um, the other option you could do is use a Raspberry Pi stacking header for the multi-module and just move it a little further off the board, but I think this will be closer to what the, the original uh, prototype was like. Now, one of the places where I ran into an issue was this header on the bottom of the SBX251 where it mounts to the multi-module adapter. Now this might look like your standard uh, .100 header that you use on all your projects lately, but it is not. These posts are actually slightly shorter, and they are 035 by 018 rectangular posts, whereas a standard header is 025 by 025. So what I found out, if you take a standard mating header and you plug it into there, it does not make good contact because these things are thinner than they are wide. Uh, so what I did is I desoldered that thing, and I have bought some standard um, 025 square post headers. I'll just put one of those in there instead, and then I will be able to plug it into my board. Now this sort of breaks compatibility with any other multi-module boards because um, this this thing is not going to mate with it. So I'll have to sort of go ahead and and resolder any boards that this would mate with in the future, uh, which can be kind of a pain, but the problem is the original header, these things, uh, the mating headers for this are just completely unobtainable. Uh, I looked everywhere, I can't find them. So we'll change it over to uh, 025 square post. Okay, here is the motherboard out of the IPDS. We're looking at the top of it here, and we can see a few things like you've got the power connector here, 
I think um, one of these is the floppy connector. I couldn't tell you whether it's this one or this one. Uh, but another one is the connector that goes to the slot where the EEPROMs plug in. Another one's probably the keyboard connector. But what's most important to us are these connectors up here, which are to the piggyback modules that go on the back side of it. So flipping the board over, we can see that there is one board here already. And this board over here is the optional processor board. That is an optional 8085 that, that turns this into a two CPU computer. It's got the little piggyback cable that goes over. Now for our bubble memory modules, we need the multi-module adapter board. And it will go right here, kind of like that. I need to stick some standoffs in there. And then the, um, the actual um, bubble memory module We'll plug in like so. That's not right. Let's get it lined up better. There we go. We'll plug in like that. Uh, then we'll have to run a ribbon cable over the top, just like they did with this one, and then a ribbon cable across here to hook up the uh, multi-module adapter up to the second processor. So I am 3D printing some standoffs because the standoffs I bought were not the right size. Um, to stand this board off the back and then we'll we'll get going with it Okay, here is the multi-module adapter mounted on the back of the Intel CPU board So I put my makeshift spacers in there. I'm kind of missing one. I need to get the right spacers uh, But anyway, it's mounted on here The next thing to do is to make up some ribbon cables for there and there and then we'll give it a shot Okay here. I have added the ribbon cable. So you got one ribbon cable goes across down there the other one kind of folds over the top up here. Um, we should be ready to go now. Now, as I mentioned, these here are kind of too tall, so I'm not going to be able to mount a board over here. I mean, I could if I put in like a Raspberry Pi stacking header, maybe space this board back a little further. It's a, it's a possibility. Uh, but this one here, I think this one here, we can go ahead and mount. So let me go ahead and do that. And finally, here it is with the SVX251 module installed. So let's go ahead and plug it in see if we get bubble memory. Okay, now that we've got the bubble memory in, let's go ahead and start it up. Start at the computer. I do have a boot floppy in there because we haven't programmed the bubble memory yet. So we're booting off the floppy. Okay, diagnostics complete. And then if we do assign, it'll show us the device assignments. And then we have to, let's go ahead and initialize one of the bubble disks. So we'll do an iDisk colon F4. I think we need to give it a volume label, so let's call it just bub. And then S will copy the system to it. iDisk F4 bub S. Okay, so right now is when we hope it's actually programming the bubble memory. Doesn't actually give us any status here, but I hope it's working. There. Now let's try a dir on uh, disk 4 and see what's there. 416 free out of 512 blocks. I'd say we just successfully formatted our bubble memory. Um, now we need to copy some files to it for it to be a useful system disk. Now I can't copy the whole floppy because this I believe is 360k floppy whereas that is um, um, only 128k of bubble. So I'm just going to copy a few files from the first disk uh, from the floppy onto the bubble. So we'll have some useful stuff there. So let's copy dir to colon f for colon. The dir command is pretty handy to have. Yeah. Uh, what did I do wrong? Oh, I forgot the word two. Dir two colon f four colon. 
Now if we do for Dur 4, we should see that it's mostly filled up. Yeah, 36 free blocks. Now we can take these discs out. Don't need them anymore. And let's see if we can reboot into bubble memory. So yeah, it's found that there is no uh, there is no boot disk and it's asked us if we want to boot from the bubble. Now you've actually got two boot from bubble prompts, that's because this is a two CPU computer. Uh, we're down here in the A CPU, I'll show you how the dual CPUs work in a moment. But there we are, IPDS. Now we're booting off the bubble, came up nice and quick. And there's our DUR and all of our files are sitting there. So perfect, we're now bootable off of uh, solid state storage. Now this is as good a time as any to talk about how the, the dual CPUs work. So this thing has two 8085s and they're both general purpose CPUs. So if I, uh, and it's a split screen window, we've got the A CPU down here on the bottom and the B CPU on the top. So let me push this here and we can make the windows bigger. So see I can make the, the B window bigger up there or smaller. Let's give it like about half. Um, now we're still down here on uh, on A. You know, if we execute dir, it's going down here in this window. Uh, if I hit Control or Function Home, now it has swapped A and B. So A is now on the top and B is at the bottom. B was sitting there waiting at its boot prompt, asking if it can boot from the bubble. So we do B, uh, tell it it can boot from its bubble. takes it a moment of course and there we are so now we're down here down here we're in the B one up there we're in the A one so you know if you wanted to to do two different things on this you could you know you could run your assembler down here and your editor up there you could program EEPROMs while you're compiling it's pretty cool to have a dual CPU computer back then so see watch I can IPPS to run the the programming software down here oh it does not function on processor B well Maybe IPPS only works on processor A. There. As I said, we can run the programming software on processor A, while over here on processor B, you know, we could just be going about our merry way, doing directories or, you know, whatever command. I don't have a whole lot of stuff I can do here, but you know, you could imagine if you had your, um, your assembler, or your compiler, or something you could be doing that, and those jobs kind of took a long time back then. So the split screen was kind of nice, and I can make it uh, smaller. Oops, let's not let it completely go away. Then let's switch. And now I want to program an EEPROM. So what we're going to do there is I have some EEPROMs on a um, on a data disk. So I have these from when I was doing some work with my AIM-65. Um, so here we are, we're in PPS, let me exit back out of that. So you can see dir F1. Uh, actually, I just need it. dir1. There are my EEPROMs. Now let me go get an EEPROM and we'll insert it in there and we'll program it. So what I actually have is some 2532 EEPROMs, this is one of them here. This thing won't program a 2532 directly because the pinout is a little bit different, so I made myself this little adapter. Uh, this is what I was using when I was working on my AIM-65 computer a few uh, weeks ago that was using 2532s. So I'll go hook this up over here, stick my adapter in the socket. Um, now let's load up that IPPS software. And the, the 2532, it looks just like a 2732, so we'll tell the programmer it's a 2732. Always good to do a blank check. Blank check from... I don't know if the addresses are necessary for if, if it would just assume the whole range, but I've always been giving it the range. So it is blank. And then I need to copy the data file that I, I have on that floppy to a buffer colon F1 colon fourth
copy that to the buffer. And we load it from the buffer. Now you can display the buffer. Good to make sure that what's in it is what's supposed to be there. As it should be. Um, gosh, I actually displayed the whole thing. Let me tap through it. So this was actually on the AIM-65, this was part of the fourth interpreter that I needed to program. So we're just going to do that again. Tab on through. I guess I could hit escape, probably do escape. But anyway, that was the fourth ROM. Um, so we've displayed the buffer. Now it's time to actually program the EEPROM. So we're going to copy buffer 0, 0, F, 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 um, to prom. Spell it right. Address zero. Uh, that ought to do. And has the red light gone on? Yep, the red light has gone on. So it is busy programming that EEPROM. Now this is going to take a while on this. You know, a, a modern USB programmer programs it very quickly. I wonder if the modern USB programmers are maybe not adhering to spec because this thing... Um, that was designed to work with this this era of EEPROMs. Programs them fairly slowly. It takes uh, several minutes. So we're just going to let it sit here and run for a little while. Okay, so it finished copying. It has the same checksum. That's a good sign. But let's do a verify buffer here. Prom zero. There we go, so we have successfully programmed our EEPROM. Well, I hope you enjoyed this quick demo of the IPDS with built-in bubble memory now. Isn't that cool? Thank you for watching my video. Please visit my website at www.smbaker.com for more electronics projects and sand rail stuff. Bye.